Hello, my name is Katherine Garrett, and this is Your Most Obedient and Humble Servant, a women's history podcast where we feature the 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't always make it into the history books. I'm your host, Katherine Garrett. Today, I am very excited to be joined by my former colleague and my good friend, Allison Robinson. Allison Robinson is a doctoral candidate in American history and American material culture at the University of Chicago. Her work focuses on objects and how they produce, challenge, and reimagine categories of identity throughout American history. Currently, Allison is researching and writing her dissertation, and she'll join the Smithsonian in September as a Smithsonian Institution pre-doctoral fellow. So, hi, Allison. Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. This is a real delight. This week, again, once again, I have somebody who worked with me at Monticello, but I am switching it up and we are doing a Washington family letter this time. To dig a little bit into the context, this is a letter that was written by Martha Washington's granddaughter, Eleanor Park Custis, later Eleanor Park Custis Lewis. Uh, She's writing it to her very good friend, Elizabeth Bordley, who's later Elizabeth Bordley Gibson. And it's written in 1796. So at this point, Eleanor is 17 years old. Uh, Her friend is 19 years old. So definitely teenage nonsense going on. They've been best friends since they were very young. At this point, 1796, George Washington is entering his last year of the presidency, but most of Eleanor's childhood has been in Philadelphia and New York, being raised by her grandparents who happen to be the president and first lady of the United States. So she has a very interesting upbringing. This letter was all right, March 30th, 1796. Allison, you dug a little bit into the context of this. Could you talk about where she's writing from? Oh, yes, of course. So she is writing from her older sister's house. She is visiting Martha and her brother-in-law, Thomas, shortly after the birth of their first child, also named Martha. A lot of Marthas. <laughs> A lot of Marthas, a lot of people with the exact same nickname, which just makes history (laughs) infinitely exciting. (laughs) Uh, Eleanor and her brother, George Washington Park Custis, are being raised by Martha Washington and George Washington. But they had two older siblings that actually stayed with their mother, Martha's daughter-in-law. Also named Eleanor. (laughs) Also named Eleanor. Yet another Nellie. Lots of Eleanors and Nellies. But so that's Eleanor Calvert. Custis, who remarried and moved with her two chil- with two of her children in with her husband's family and then continued to have more children with her new husband. So I think sometimes people talk about Martha and George Washington's family and they get hyper-focused on the kids that were with the Washingtons in Philadelphia. It's easy to forget that this was actually a big family, that Eleanor uh, has a lot of siblings and half-siblings that she is visiting, actually. They're writing back and forth. It's not like she was completely cut off from her mother and her family. Family. She still has a relationship with them, but it's just interesting because she was raised by her grandmother. So just sort of a reminder of the context there. So this letter is while she's visiting her sister, and she's close by to where her mother and stepfather and all of those half-siblings are living. So they're probably writing from Thomas Peter's house on K Street at this point, and she's writing back to Philadelphia to her good friend that she's apparently been missing while she's been visiting family. Does that sound about right? Anything you want to add to that context, Allison? No, sounds spot on. And now, the letter. Eleanor Park Custis to Elizabeth Bordley. Washington, February 7th, 1796. My dear Elizabeth, it is now three weeks since I received your affectionate letter. I am really ashamed that I have not answered it before, but I will waive all excuses and tell you the real truth. I sat down to answer it a fortnight ago and wrote almost one side when company coming in prevented me from finishing it. Two or three times since, I have attempted answering your letter, but was prevented. This evening, I was determined to devote to you, and as yet, luckily, no interruption. I shall just give you a sketch of my present situation. In Sister Peter's room, Patty and the child asleep, Thomas reading, and your humble servant writing to E. Bordley, for whom, between ourselves, I have a kind of friendship. Since I wrote last, I am become an aunt, two or three inches taller upon the strength of it as you may suppose. My dear sister has been very ill, but is now, thank God, pretty well again. And my little niece, a very fat, handsome, good-tempered, clever toad. Its nose and forehead very like its father's, and its mouth and chin like Patty's. I think its eyes are a very deep blue, but Sister Peter insists upon it that they are hazel. It has a great deal of beautiful brown hair. Her name is to be Martha Eliza Eleanor Peter and to be called Eleanor. 
Martha is after Grandmama and Sister Peter, Eliza after Mama's mother, Old Mrs. Peter, Grandmama's sister, Mr. Peter's eldest sister, and my sister, and Eleanor after Mama, and your most obedient, very humble servant, Eleanor Park Custis. Thus, all the names of its nearest relations are taken in at once, without giving offense to any. I approve very much of this way of getting quit of all the family names at once. You also approve of it, no doubt. You must know that I am housekeeper, nurse, and a long train of etc. at present. Mama and Sister Eliza went from this to Hope Park yesterday and left me here to take care of my sister Peter, young niece, and the house. I assure you I am quite domesticated, stay constantly at home, and am an excellent manager, nurse, and housekeeper. I have been out but twice since I came here, which is three weeks, to one assembly which was a very agreeable one, and once to see Cousin Lear, who was sick and sent for me. I have a piece of information to give you which I think will surprise you a little. I shall be Miss Custis in two or three months, as my sister Eliza is engaged to Mr. Law, whom I suppose you will have seen, and will be married in a short time. Strange, most passing strange, quite unaccountable, you will cry. Tis strange, my dear, but nevertheless quite true, believe me. E. Custis and E. Bordley spinsters, and so likely to remain to the end of time. What say you to this? Agreed? Well, be it so. De tout mon coeur. Uncle Edward Calvert is to be tied the 1st of March to a very amiable, handsome girl of 18, a Miss Biscoe of Nottingham. I have told you all the news, therefore must now conclude with my love to your mama and papa. Patty and brother Peter desire to be remembered to you. Excuse and burn this very badly written scrawl, and believe me your sincere and most affectionate friend, Eleanor Park Custis. Okay, so, Allison, as sort of a quick summary, what is going on in this letter? What do you take from it? So the things that jump out at me immediately to this letter are that, one, it's been three weeks since she last wrote her friend. One can only assume that it aligns at least somewhat with her arrival to visit her sister and brother-in-law. Yeah. Two, as perhaps all teenagers, it is important that she has not left the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which we can chat about, um, but also that she's just so thrilled to be an aunt and to be part of the naming process for this child. It seems like she is just so excited. Not only is her name included within the, I mean, I also have four names, but included within the very long name of this child, but that the child's nickname is also her name. That's great. That's a personal win. And of course... The last element, in addition to all of her duties as a lady of the house, in this case, would be her sister Eliza's engagement, yes. which uh, you and I know was quite salacious news at the time. First off, I think it's very cute that she says she grew two or three inches on yes. <laughs> being an aunt. I, yes. As someone who has recently become an aunt myself, I completely understand what she's talking about. Oh, it's a great gig. It's the best. An interesting thing about this naming convention uh as somebody who works quite a bit with the papers of this family they are they do all have the same names and it, even she's joking about it as she's writing listing all the people who this person is named after but then what's interesting is she really did get quit of all the family names and then she was done with it her sister martha all, the rest of her daughters were given really inventive names she has a daughter named columbia uh america and my favorite britannia <laughs> i mean you don't want to accidentally offend any of your step-grandfather's acquaintances or political alliances by perhaps not naming your child after their nation. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, it's not very politically expedient. <laughs> and, and it is instead of having, with all these big families, instead of having to name all your kids after all these different people, just name one kid after all of the people and then do whatever you want. Exactly. You got great-grandmothers, grandmothers, mom, aunts on both sides. You truly have every conceivable woman who could be angry that she wasn't part of the naming process covered in one fell swoop. I have a lot of respect for it. <laughs> That part's very cute. I do also, I like that she talks about how she's only left the house twice in three weeks. Yes, but I mean, you can imagine how for a teenager who's 17 years old, who's on the cusp of coming out in society, who is still going to balls in the Georgetown area, but is perhaps interested 
in mingling with other people her own age is feeling oh, the burdens of aunthood if she has to run the household and be a nurse and all of these things that we know were assisted yes but it's just it's a big shift when you're used to your freedom in philadelphia as the first president's step granddaughter to being trapped in the house yes i imagine social life in philadelphia was pretty exciting at this point i love that simply because it is an understatement for <laughs> eleanor park custis who had and education and social obligations that could truly boggle your mind, particularly com when compared to literally any other person in this time period. She had such an exceptional life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and I think it comes through in just even the way she wrote the letter. This is a very well-written, as much as she apologizes for the scrawl, it's definitely, I mean, there's sort of short sentences. You can tell it's a teenager writing, but like, very clear grammar, very formal. Um, you can tell that she got a good education. She had every opportunity what one might expect of the granddaughter of George Washington. So while she was in New York, she attended a school by Isabella Graham, which was an incredibly elite space. And some of the skills that she was learning obviously include spelling, grammar, reading, and English, which we can see so plainly in how well composed this letter is. But she's also picking up skills in embroidery, in arithmetic, geography, drawing, and my personal favorite, Japaning. For <laughs> those who are interested, this oh. is an incredibly involved process by which you're painting a piece of furniture black and decorating it with all sorts of scenes inspired from East Asia, typically. Oh. But it requires so many layers of lacquering and such careful detail work to execute it. It's a very hard skill. <laughs> so the fact that she's learning all of these skills that one would need to run a household, including math, language, reading, music and dancing, so you can entertain people, but also painting both canvas and furniture, that's just, that's incredible. And she's, she's a young girl at this period. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you're able to bring your material culture knowledge into this because I would have read that word and had no idea what that meant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would be more than happy to send pictures of Japan furniture to include in your show notes because it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and she's just 17 years old. So that's incredible. Um, yeah. So how would that compare, though, to her brother's education, her brother, George Washington Park Custis? Oh, George Washington Park Custis. <laughs> Poor little George Washington Park Custis. Uh <laughs> it is important to note that in Philadelphia, she still had an extremely elite education, but it was a little different. Mm -hmm. It was with private tutors that she shared with Elizabeth Bordley. You know, got to get educated with your best friend when she's in town. Nice. Um, but these skills are more focused on painting, dancing, music, very accomplished harpsichordist. Washi, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he is a great a great quote about how Nellie would cry and play and play and cry as their grandmother was forcing her to practice. But uh, Washi, Washi had so many, so many opportunities that were that were missed opportunities. Um, his his education was more traditional. It was the sciences. It was mathematics reading, writing, English, language. He actually attended the Academy of Philadelphia, started by Benjamin Franklin in 1751, wow. which was an academy, as one might expect, for boys to prepare them for college. But uh, Washi, didn't, he didn't do so hot. He spent a lot of time attending elite schools and colleges and perhaps not fulfilling his full potential. But that was, it was just something that it, it rubbed George Washington the wrong way a little bit. <laughs> uh, the Trying to um, write a footnote about George Washington Park Custis's education was basically just a list of the schools he was kicked out of. <laughs> yes, yes, including Princeton. <laughs> uh, and when he was a toddler, they called him Tubbs. Oh, no. <laughs> so, the, sort of um, slightly mean nicknames for toddlers. I love that she calls her niece a clever toad. She does. It's okay, she was smart. <laughs> it's a clever little toad. <laughs> oh, but yeah, their education is an interesting snapshot into the different opportunities that boys and girls had when you're looking at the elite, elite, elite 
white upper classes. Mm -hmm. Women are being trained to be ladies, boys are being trained to be gentlemen, and the skills that are required of both are, they have some overlap in terms of reading and math and conversation and dancing, but overall the emphasis on scholarly work versus hostessing and learning how to run a household are just quite different. Yeah. And and what doesn't come through in this letter, because talking about running a household, as always, when you're talking about the gentry class, it's Eleanor might have been managing a household, but she's managing a staff of enslaved people. And they do not appear at all in this letter, which uh, is interesting to note because they would there would have been the presence of slavery in the South and this type of household would have been everywhere and yet also invisible when you look at some of these documents. Um, oh, so yes. I wanted to get a little bit into that also because yeah. she's saying multiple times how much work she's doing, right? How she is the housekeeper and nurse and all of these et cetera's and all of that. But she wasn't really the one doing these things. She was managing these things. Yeah, yeah. And we actually, we know the name of the domestic enslaved worker who was charged with raising all of the Peter children, Barbara Twine Cole, who oh. originally came from George Washington's plantation, Mount Vernon. I don't know precisely if it was upon the arrival of young Eleanor or if it was, you know, soon after, but there is um, a pretty clear lineage of the Twine family, starting mm -hmm. with um, Sal Twine, who was an enslaved man at, oh, sorry, not Mount Vernon, at Dog Run. And the lineage continues with Barbara Twine Cole's daughter also becoming a wedding present upon the marriage of Britannia, actually. And this is an aspect of slavery that I think um, people forget about sometimes is family members being given away as presents like this uh, is there's people talk about family separations after someone dies when somebody is sold something like that for money but there is always this uncertainty if you were somebody who was enslaved at this time period that you could be working in somebody's household ha make a family build your life and you never knew even uh when people talk about well this was a plantation where they didn't use corporal punishment every single plantation would still be like well this child my daughter got married so to benefit my personal daughter, I'm going to separate you from your child and you might not ever see that child again. Okay, all right. So I think we have we have hinted at it enough. And obviously, Eleanor herself waits till the end of the letter because she knows this is the juiciest tidbit and she's going to blow Elizabeth's mind with this little fact. Uh, she shares the knowledge that her sister Elizabeth is engaged to a Mr. Law. And then she makes a big deal about how you'll probably be aware of Mr. Law and how strange the situation is. So... What was so strange about the situation, Allison? Okay, so Thomas Law, he was a tax collector for the East India Company for 18 years. While a member of the East India Company, um, he entered a sexual relationship with a woman who was native to the area, and they had three sons in the process. So he is an Englishman who is now returning to England with three half-white, half-Indian boys. So he spends a couple of years in England. He uh, also has a falling out with the East India Company because he disagrees with their stance on the war with France. So he thinks, well, what's a better place than England to raise my three boys? I know, the great land of the United States of America. So he picks them up and he moves the two oldest, George and John, to uh, New York, I believe. Actually, no, I think it was Washington. I don't know, it was somewhere on the East Coast. Anyway, again, what is so unusual about this? The United States, certainly since the mid 1600s, is so, I'm not gonna say clearly defined because that's not true, but is working very, very hard at trying to uh, understand and explain this black white binary that has emerged yes. in the colonies as a result of racialized slavery. Enlightenment thinkers are trying to explain how and truly just an entire group of people could end up enslaved. And uh, Thomas Law, he's like game in the system a little bit because mm -hmm. he has biracial children, but they're not black. And so America was a place where they could develop an identity that was, uh, that defied the, it's weird to call it a racial order because it's, it's not strict at all in this period, but defied the way that people just like categorize those around him is how I would phrase it. There is one letter where Law actually writes about talking about how he actually took his sons to America because there at least, he seems to think there will be less racial prejudice, which seems incredible to me, but it might be, as you're saying, as America is this sort of mixed race country with this 
bizarre racialized slavery system that people are more used to seeing brown people like yeah. out and about, but an Indian person might have a different type of prejudices against them. If they don't quite fit a binary, which is itself actively being constructed and yes. discussed by people both on the ground and enlightenment thinkers on both sides of the pond, um, maybe they might have a chance to try to join elite society as white because they're not necessarily, they don't neatly fit into the spectrum of like race in America. Speaking of the black white binary in America, I actually recently taught a class at the University of Chicago where my undergraduate students spent 11 weeks studying objects that embodied different categories of identity over two centuries in America. And I would encourage, heavily encourage, all of your listeners to check out this digital history project because I am really delighted with how it turned out. Oh, absolutely. The name is quite long, but my students came up with it themselves, so I'm pretty pleased with it. It's called Narratives and Counter-Narratives to Two Centuries of Race, Gender, and Class in American Material Culture. And you can find it at voices.uchicago.edu forward slash reproducing race and gender. And uh, I'm happy to share it with you in your show notes. Yeah, I will put that in the show notes for sure. So check that out. Thank you so much. Please do. Like sort of, I guess, setting the scene a little bit, we've got this new, the capital of the country hasn't yet moved to Washington, D.C. yet, but they're in the process of preparing for the move of the capital. Uh, and it takes a minute. <laughs> it, it takes a minute. Thomas Law was trying to make money off of buying land in yes. Washington City at this point uh, in preparation for the capital moving there. So he was seen a little bit as an opportunist because he's this wealthy East India guy coming in, buying up a lot of land. And he also arrives on the scene with two mixed race sons, no wife to speak of, and is very cagey whenever asked about those sons. Oh, yes, he is super secretive about their mother. And I think it is it's worth stating explicitly that his East India Company money while not a tremendous amount of money, it was what allowed him to do land speculation. So he was yes. certainly better off than most. And you might think, well, maybe he tried to keep this sort of hush-hush, but we have letters from the time where this people are talking about this. Uh, there is some fantastic letters between John and Abigail Adams where they really are just letting their feelings known uh, about the situation. My personal favorite, because it gives a little bit of an insight, I think, to Martha Washington, John Adams writes to Abigail. uh, He says that, he says, Betsy Custis is to be married next month to Mr. Law, the English East Indian nabob, which is great. They're always describing people as nabobs. Um, The good lady, which is Martha, the good lady is gay as a girl and tells the story in a very humorous style. Mr. Law says he's only 35 years of age, and although the climate of India has given him an older look, yet his constitution is not impaired beyond his years. Can we just talk about how bold it is to move literally around the entire world, insert yourself into the family of the first president of the (laughs) United States, and then bring your sons into that family as well. Yes, I, I, it's bold. <laughs> it's the boldest thing you could possibly do. I'm speechless is what I am. And it just, it just makes it all the more shocking that, you know, this is 1796, only a year after Patsy marries Thomas Peter, mm-hmm. who everyone loves. <laughs> And then Eliza announces that she's engaged to a man that everyone is suspicious of. Patsy marries Thomas Peter in this beautiful wedding on the first president's 30th wedding anniversary. It's a grand affair. Everyone's excited. Cue a year later. (laughs) Who is this guy? But the fact that everyone knows who he is is clear in this letter because Eleanor just refers to him as Mr. Long. You don't even need to add added information because he's such a known quantity. He has made himself such a known quantity. That's incredible. 
It's incredible. Even uh, Elizabeth herself, Eliza, is kind of known for being sort of a character. She has a portrait from Gilbert Stewart where she's got her arms crossed. She's looking at the artist with a sort of irritated expression. And it's just very different from what you'd usually see from women at this time. And there are a lot of descriptions of Eliza as being very outgoing, very mannish. She wears men's clothing sometimes. Um, oh. Yes, she has was sort of famous for having this like big hat with feathers in it and wearing men's riding clothes and riding horses around early DC. You know, so, she's got a strong personality. A strong personality married to another very bold man. I just, there's such an interesting early Washington City couple. Oh yes, oh yes. And people were uh, equally gossipy upon their separation they that it is not a happy marriage it does not end well uh, divorce. so jumping into the future a little bit this is an early divorce or uh, marital separation in dc society mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in 1811 she did have a was it alimony early alimony but yes well and so and she and thomas have one daughter also named eliza she names her daughter after herself baby eliza I don't know that much about her, but I can only imagine she was also feisty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're interested in the sort of infamous Thomas Law and his family and what happened to them, please do look into it. So there's some really interesting articles that have been published recently about his family and about the young half Indian young men growing up and they did end up getting a good education. One of them went to Princeton. Princeton. One of his sons went to Princeton. It doesn't appear in the exchange between John and Abigail Adams, but they only mention two sons. But we know that there were actually three. And this third son appears shortly before the divorce happens. (laughs) He arrived in America in 1794 with two sons. Everyone's talking about this like very curious man with a very mysterious past with two sons, but also like money. (laughs) 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 And then one decade later, eight years into his uh, marriage to young Eliza that just saying was also the year that Edmund then four now 14 comes from England to America I don't know why but if your listeners know why I would love I would love to find out because the timing the timing (laughs) yes someone has to know if we can turn this into a true crime podcast for a moment someone knows something please send us (laughs) <laughs> what Please research comment. that you have because we have we don't know and we would love to find out before we before we move on from talking about marriage we must talk about nelly bemoaning playfully her spinster state yes at 17 years old so of course do you think she's do you think that she's actually super boy crazy and is just making a joke about being a spinster or what what's your take my take is that she's Maybe she's curious about boys at this period, certainly. She's expressed not being super taken with the one she, she's met so far. Um, but I suspect that's more of just like a playful ribbing each other. Her friend is an only child. She's also unmarried. She'd actually marry much later after Nellie would. Nellie would get married only three years after writing this letter. So, you know, I don't know what it was about, you know, George Washington's nephew. <laughs> Wait, actually, I do know one thing about their courtship, which is that it happened after Washington's retirement, and he literally hired his, he's like, send me a nephew. He's like, I need somebody to come to Mount Vernon, because I want to go to bed, and these young people keep staying up and talking, so I need somebody here to hang out with the young people so I can go to sleep. I gotta believe that he set that up. George Washington, little Cupid, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, whatever the motivation, maybe it's sleep deprivation, but I have to believe. <laughs> but yes, so at 17. She's a... Uh, she's a spinster, for sure. But I just, I take this letter as one that's more, you know, joking, ribbing than seriousness, simply because she uses the phrase, so likely to remain at the end of time. What say to you this? Agreed? Agreed. <laughs> Pinky promise. Let's exactly. never get married. Exactly. Ride or die is what it is. <laughs> it's within an era where actually her older sister Martha did get married at 17. You can understand how maybe seeing her sister getting married, heaven forbid, at 19, that those two years, those are make or break. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you'll get married. Maybe you'll stay a spinster. 
and you could marry the perfect Mr. Peter or the terrible Mr. Law. Oh There's all sorts of <laughs> dangers that she could fall into. I do want to point out this this sort of it, this is a I think it is a telling quote from Abigail Adams. Uh, she writes in response to uh, John Adams when they're talking about Thomas Law. She says, I know Law. He will never see 45 again unless he lives to 90. Nice sick burn, Abigail. But then uh, <laughs> she goes, he will do for a Virginia girl who would stand no chance where black are so plenty and manners so licentious of marrying one of her own statesmen without some progeny. So let's Yikes. dig into what that means. Um because uh, I think as a tour guide, a lot of times I would talk about how common mixed race children with enslaved women were, uh, particularly at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Obviously, that comes up quite a bit. Uh, but this is something that was everywhere, but is not usually written about or stated in such an explicit way as Abigail Adams is doing right here. So she's saying that Elizabeth is going to have a hard time finding another Southern man that doesn't already have some mixed race kids. So it's maybe not a deal breaker for her because everybody in Virginia is just living with this and dealing with this constantly, just not talking about it in letters. Oh, yeah. Interracial sex is everywhere. Interracial marriage is illegal. Yep, exactly. So uh, and that is another thing that you become more aware of as you dig into all of the details of these historic letters and not necessarily just picking and choosing the quotes that you pull out of them. You see more of this evidence sort of sprinkled in. But again, if you're reading a lot of white people's letters, you're not going to hear much about it because there really was such a culture of silence uh, around yeah. something that everybody could see before their eyes. Yes, 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 yes. We didn't mention, I think it, it showed up in bits and pieces, but we didn't mention the tremendous age gap between these two people. <laughs> For Thomas Law, as, uh, as as our delightful hostess has already pointed out, was uh, 35. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, Elizabeth Park Custis was on the cusp of her 20th birthday. Yep. And uh, her step-grandfather, George Washington, not real psyched <laughs> about that. <laughs> I believe that <laughs> that is one of George Washington's only pieces of advice is don't marry somebody much older than you. And Elizabeth was like, hmm, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> like one month later, marrying this guy. <laughs> right? Scandalous. That's scandalous. It's her saying now that I will be Miss Custis because yes. uh, being one of three daughters, uh, whoever was the eldest would be Miss Custis and the younger two would be their full names and depending on who was married. So now, finally, it's Nellie's time to be Miss Custis and not Miss Eleanor Custis. Wah, wah. I don't know. For me, it's kind of like a sad trombone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily an honor to be Miss Custis. She's now spinster Miss Custis. And you know, if the boys would just up their game, maybe it wouldn't be <laughs> a problem. But I think that that makes it all the more important that in this letter she's mentioning that she didn't leave the house more than two times in about three weeks because she's seeing her sisters getting married. She's remarking on, you know, the quality of these gentlemen, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But she's also, like, not super taken with the whole running a household thing. <laughs> she's She wants to have fun. Once she's done yeah. crying into that harpsichord, she wants to go hang out. <laughs> exactly. So I think that actually leads us pretty nicely into sort of a summary of the letter. So is there anything that about this particular letter that strikes you as relatable, high key relatable? Oh, sure. I mean, I would say when there is hot gossip, you need to tell your best friend immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest takeaway for me personally. Sure, they didn't have texting and sure... She did mention that she waited three weeks to write that letter, but she saved the hottest gossip for last. Oh, yeah. also, if you if you are anything like me and have a comically long name, <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty clear that families have been naming their children <clears throat> after each other for years, <laughs> forever. <laughs> and when in doubt, just take Eleanor's advice and take everyone's names and name the child that. Problem just solved. get it out of the way. I'd also just add that, you know, people are always going to comment on who you date. <laughs> <laughs> Gossip has really not <laughs> changed. <laughs> That's a lesson that I've learned from this podcast. <laughs> uh, 
And I guess uh, as far as differences, I will say definitely being 17 and having all of your family members married, I would say that's something that probably I'm thankful that that has changed. (laughs) Yes, 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 me too. Also, I mean, just she's she's so exceptional. She's so such an exception in American history. (laughs) Beyond these, you know, very basic relatable things, um, no one else is like her period. <laughs> yeah. If you're if you're looking for a letter that sums up what early American women are like, this is probably not the place to go. This is not it. This is absolutely not it. So one of the advantages of being able to read these letters of women who have the privilege and the educational background to actually express themselves is that we also get a really great sense of who they were as people. Yeah. Where uh, Nellie is uh, she's pretty spunky. She's got a like a lighthearted sense of humor. You can see how much she really just treasures her family and her friends that she's just so proud to be an aunt. And she's so proud that her name is attached to this child. This is like a huge moment in her life. Yeah. You can also tell that she's, she has uh, received some training in household management, even if she doesn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, we, uh, we just have a good sense of her likes and dislikes. We have a good sense of her interests, the people that she uh, has in her social circle, and uh, her her thoughts on all those things. And she she has a lot of them. <laughs> so <Yes>. many thoughts. <laughs> well, Allison, this was a delightful conversation. I had a wonderful time talking about this with you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. I had an absolute blast. To my listeners, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode. Uh, and as always... I am, as ever, your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much.